Welcome to this weekly edition of A Plus Weekly, my news roundup of what has caught my eye this week in the tech world, focusing on the Apple ecosystem and all the things that are newsworthy, useful and some fun too. A Plus Weekly comes out first on YouTube as a video podcast to watch along with and a few days later out on the usual podcast platforms. Please do like, subscribe, follow, leave a five star review and even some kind words. It all helps so much to help people find my show. This is, as I say, a podcast kind of show, so it will be pretty relaxed with light edits. You might even have seen some standalone clips which made you curious about the full show. If that's true, please drop me a comment below to let me know you found the show that way. With that said, welcome once again and let me roll on with the show. Today I'm covering how Siri seems broken and what Apple is going to do about that in the face of all this new AI that seems to be leapfrogging, well actually pole vaulting, over voice assistance from Apple, Amazon and Google. I'll cover a neat new chat GPT implementation for your Apple Watch. Watch out for me on that later in the week on my A plus YouTube channel for a bit more detail. After that, we'll cover a possible iPhone fold, a roundup of the latest rumors on the iPhone 15 and what looks like a price shock for that iPhone coming down the line and what that might mean for Apple's pricing strategy. And speaking of iPhone pricing strategy, we'll talk about how the 14 Plus seems to be selling with possible implications for any new mini phone we may see in Apple's lineup in future years. And we'll also catch up with some news on what's going on with Apple in the midst of this cost and supply chain crunch. Let me start with Siri. Ah, Siri. You seem to behave even more weirdly than usual, being triggered when I'm reading stories with my kids without me saying the trigger phrase or anything like it. And when you used to be really specific to the closest device, you now get triggered all over the place. My Apple Watch, my 13 Mini, my HomePod Mini, and even my wife's iPhone 12 Mini too. I'm not actually gonna say the phrase for fear of the whole household being triggered. Last night, it even got triggered when my wife and I were watching a TV show and it started spouting nonsense about something or other and when the HomePod Mini asked if we wanted to know more we both shouted no and that was the end of it. But is this happening to you too? I'm curious. Drop me a note in the comments or email me if you've experienced something similar. The details are in the description or show notes. But you know what Siri? If your lack of specificity isn't enough I think I might just be hearing the final nails in your coffin being hammered in. Your clunky design of rigid responses has left a totally open goal and the chatbots are scoring at will. And it's not just Apple, Alexa and Google Assistant are all being hammered too. Siri has been around for 12 years now. But in all that time, there really hasn't been anything added you could say has truly transformed how most people use it. In fact, they probably turned into a nerd only kind of thing, which our three and six year olds marvel at. But even our six year old laughs at Siri's incompetence these days. Chatbots are the new craze and the tech world and even the six year olds can't stop talking about it. These AI powered bots like ChatGPT and OpenAI's new ChatGPT Plus can answer questions. You type in a chat box in a flash. People have taken advantage of ChatGPT to do hard stuff like coding software, putting together business proposals and writing fiction even. And ChatGPT, which uses AI to guess what word comes next, is swiftly improving. And just this week, OpenAI disclosed its next generation AI engine, GPT-4, which powers ChatGPT. The hype surrounding chatbots just shows how Siri, Alexa, and the voice assistants lost the head start they once had in AI. The products have had multiple hitches over the last 10 years. John Berkey, an ex-Apple engineer who worked on the assistant, said that Siri ran into tech issues, including clunky code that took forever to add basic features. Amazon and Google misjudged how people would use the voice assistants, plowing tons of cash into areas that didn't pay off. When the experiments bombed, the company said their excitement for the tech fizzled. 
They totally took their eye off the ball. Development stagnated, petrified, stood still. Now, Microsoft chief Nadella called voice assistants dumb as rock in an interview with the Financial Times this month and said that newer AI will take the lead. Microsoft has teamed up with OpenAI, investing $13 billion in the startup and incorporating its tech for Bing and other products, including plans to bring it into the office suite of products, supercharging exposure to the technology in one move. When invited to comment on this by the New York Times, Apple declined. Google declared that they were devoted to providing an awesome virtual assistant to help people on their phones, in the house, and in their cars. But it was pretty notable that the demo of their product, Bard, pretty much flopped. Amazon revealed a 30% rise in customer involvement with Alexa around the world over the last year and was optimistic about its mission to create first-class AI. They didn't say how, they didn't say when. So why do Alexa, Google Assistant and Siri seem so old fashioned, antiquated and clunky when compared to this new generation of AI products? It's worth thinking about just how they are built and trained to get a flavor of just how much work most of the big tech players have ahead of them. The new generation chatbots are driven by large language models. These are systems taught to recognize and create text from gigantic data sets taken from the web. They can then come up with words to complete a sentence. Siri, Alexa, and Google Assistant are basically command and control systems. They can understand a limited list of questions and requests like, what's the weather like in Los Angeles? Or turn off the bedroom lights. If a user asks an old school virtual assistant to do something it's not programmed to do, the bot just says it's not possible. Mr. Berkey again, who took up improving Siri in 2014, said its design was so awkward it took forever to add new features. Siri has a massive list of words from musicians to restaurants in over 20 languages. That made it one big snowball. If someone wanted to add a word to Siri's database, Berkey said, it goes in one big pile. According to Berkey, even small changes like adding some phrases to the data set would mean rebuilding the whole database, which could take up to six weeks. Tacking on more complex features like new search tools could take around a year. He said there was no way to make Siri a creative assistant like ChatGPT. So what will Apple do? And what about Amazon and Google, who are also scrambling to respond? The New York Times reports that at Apple's headquarters last month, the company held its annual AI summit, an internal event for employees to learn about its large language models and other AI tools. Sources have reported that engineers, which include members of the Siri team, have been conducting language generating tests every week. AI professionals have predicted that in the future, the technologies of chatbots and voice assistants will combine. This means people will be able to control the chatbots through voice commands, and those who use products of Apple, Amazon, and Google will be able to ask the virtual assistants to help them with their jobs, not only tasks like checking the weather. Aravind Srinivas, the founder of Perplexity, an AI startup featuring a chatbot-powered search engine, declared that these products had not been successful in the past as there was no human-level dialogue capabilities. But now we do have them. I started this segment by saying I could hear the nails being hammered into the coffin of Siri, but actually I can't because I have little idea what Apple are going to do with Siri in the face of this AI onslaught. Though 9to5Mac are reporting that, in the latest tvOS 16.4 beta, Apple has enabled a new framework for Siri natural language generation capabilities. As it currently stands, Apple is only using natural language generation for telling jokes with Siri on Apple TV. The company is experimenting with how language generation could be used for timers as well. I think this is all still leaving Apple looking pretty vulnerable. Let me know what you think Apple should do here. I'd love to hear your thoughts or any tips you might have. Drop me a comment on YouTube if you've watched here or over on my Substack page. The links to both are in the show notes. So if Siri is broken, how do you use this new AI technology on your Apple devices? One neat little way is a new paid watch app called Petey. 
PT's app helps you get answers from OpenAI's chatbot, either by typing on your Apple Watch or using voice input, much what I prefer to do. Plus, it's like a conversation, so you can keep chatting to the chatbot about the stuff you already asked about, though I haven't quite figured that out yet. PT has a watch face complication that makes it super easy to use without having to go through your apps beats asking Siri since it just sends web results to your iPhone usually. But if you've got a query and all you've got is your watch, PT can help. And the answers are apparently usually way better than any digital assistant can give you. You can get the answers read out loud with text to speech and you can share the results of your conversation via text, email or social media. But I haven't figured out the social media bit yet. I've downloaded after paying $6.99 in New Zealand dollars for it and I will give it a try. So be sure to come back to my YouTube channel at A Plus Chap soon for my results using that app and functionality in a separate video. All right, next up is a folding iPhone still on the drawing board. Rumors have circulated that Apple is still working on a foldable version of the iPhone, which was first reported back in 2016. According to a patent application reviewed by Insider on March 16th, Apple is considering ways to prevent serious damage to its screen if it is dropped. The application, self-retracting display device and techniques for protecting screen using drop detection, suggests a device with a fall detector or accelerometer. Tripping it would cause the folding display to automatically retract. If it's close to the ground or a surface though, it won't get a chance to shut completely. The patent application said that even if the display is folded at an angle less than 180 degrees, there'll be some kind of protection since the mobile device will hit the edges instead of the display full on. Ben Wood, research chief at CCS Insight, reported to CNBC last October that a foldable iPhone was probably going to be priced at roughly $2,500. The most expensive iPhone, the 14 Pro Max, costs up to $1,599, which is almost $1,000 less than that. All this may show is that a foldable iPhone may not be in Apple's plans just yet, but they are looking into it. All right, next up, let's talk iPhones. More about iPhones. The iPhone 15 lineup is still half a year out, but there's already been a ton of speculation about it. Word is that the iPhone 15 Pro will get a titanium frame, plus loads of other features. Let's run down 11 features rumored for iPhone 15 Pro models that are not expected to be available on the standard iPhone 15 and iPhone 15 Plus. First, the iPhone 15 Pro should have Apple's A17 Bionic chip made with TSMC's three nanometer process to boost performance and save energy. Looks like the iPhone 15 and 15 Plus will have an A16 Bionic chip. Second, just like the Apple Watch Ultra, the iPhone 15 Pro models are likely to be made with that titanium frame rather than stainless steel. And third, also like the recent Apple Watch designs, the iPhone 15 Pro will have thin curved edges around the display. Fourth, analyst Ming-Chi Kuo says that the iPhone 15 Pro models will have a USB-C port with USB 3.2 or Thunderbolt 3, which would make data transfer much speedier than the older phones and their lightning ports. According to Quo, the USB-C port on the iPhone 15 will be stuck at USB 2.0 speeds, just like the lightning connector. Fifth, according to a leaked schematic, the iPhone 15 Pro will have Wi-Fi 6E for a speed boost. Sixth, according to TrendForce, the Pro version of the iPhone 15 will have eight gigabytes of RAM, while the regular models will stay likely at six gigabytes. Now, if you have more RAM, it can help Safari keep more content active in the background so it doesn't have to reload when you open it back up and other speed improvements like that. Seven, Quo says the iPhone 15 Pro models will have solid state volume and power buttons. You may have seen a lot of stuff around that this week. The analyst said the devices will have two extra haptic engines that give haptic feedback, just like the home button on the iPhone SE or the trackpad on newer MacBooks. So you get the sensation of pressing a button, but they don't actually move. 
8. It's rumored the iPhone 15 Pro will have a mute button. All iPhones have a mute switch, so that may look and function a little differently now. 9. Quo claims the iPhone 15 Pro Max will have a periscope telephoto lens. The device could have up to six times optical zoom, way more than the three times on the iPhone 14 Pro. But there's also talk that this feature may only be reserved for a new top-end phone above the Pro models, the Ultra. 10th, iPhone 15 Pro's new power-efficient LiDAR scanner supplied by Sony should make 3D depth scanning better for AR apps and give night mode photos a bit of a boost, says Quo. Again. And 11th, according to 9to5Mac, the iPhone Pro will be available in a new dark red option. Still no word on the iPhone 15 mini, so that's bad news as far as I'm concerned. More on that later in the show. So does all this mean that we're in for a price shock with the iPhone 15? Jeff Poo from Haitong International Securities via Mac Rumors said, Apple will probably raise the prices of the iPhone 15 Pro and iPhone 15 Pro Max around the world. Poo talks about hardware changes, and we just talked about these like the new titanium body, solid state sound and mute buttons, and the impressive A17 chip, extra RAM, periscope, zoom lens as the main reasons for these price hikes. Now this analyst said that the iPhone 15 Pro and Pro Max may increase by as much as $200 each. Ouch. Now these price hikes could make the more affordable models look more attractive, in particular the iPhone 15 Plus, which will be the only cheap big screen iPhone. After all, bridging $400 is a lot, even on a multi-year contract. It might be a genius move, maybe not. We'll have to wait and see. Now is Apple slashing their own costs as well as trying to book this increased revenue. Last week, a report got into the cost-cutting measures Apple is taking to avoid big layoffs. It's no surprise these policies will affect Apple's future releases to consumers. According to Mark German from Bloomberg's Power On newsletter, Apple is trying to figure out how to use the research and development money more effectively. They're concentrating their spending on more pressing projects while leaving others for later. Apple has done some stuff to slow down spending because of economic worries. The company's holding back on employee bonuses, cutting back on travel and looking into remote work rules and other things. Unlike Google, Amazon and Meta, Apple has been able to stay away from mass layoffs. Tim Cook has said layoffs are a last resort kind of thing, but he also noted that they can be never completely ruled out. It's been almost half a year since the amazing iPhone 14 lineup came out last September. As is usual for a major flagship launch, there was also a bit of a stir, especially when it came to Apple's decision to change the iPhone 13 mini to an iPhone 14 Plus. Did Apple make the right calls on this? Apparently the answer is yes, which is unfortunate if you're a mini fan like I am. Display supply chain consultants put out a report talked about here on Phone Arena about the panel shipments for the iPhone 14 series, which can give us an idea on the different models' success. Fascinating results. The iPhone 14 series is slightly more popular than the previous one, with a 2% rise in the number of display shipments from last April. As expected, the Pro iPhones are still better than the regular ones, an ongoing pattern from past years. The report also reveals that this year's income is probably higher due to Apple selling more of the high-end models instead of the low-end ones. The standard iPhone 14 model has seen a big 36% decrease, whilst Pro and Pro Max have seen 22% and 23% increases. Interesting to note, shipments of the iPhone 14 Plus are up 59% compared to the iPhone 13 mini. No more discussion mini or plus. The argument is most likely settled as far as Apple are concerned. However, there is some schadenfreude for the mini fans in noting that the iPhone 14 plus is still the least chosen of the iPhone 14 models. That's a wrap for this week. Subscribe and hit that bell to make sure you don't miss out on my next video. I'm Saab Johal and this channel is A+. I hope you've enjoyed this new feature that's coming up weekly from now on. Thanks for watching and listening wherever you are and see you again soon.